sorry uh, that this has to be remote. Uh, I was hoping to give this talk in person. I was there on Monday, uh, as some of you might have noticed. I unfortunately had to travel back home. Uh, but through the magic of uh, the internet, it's all good. Okay. Uh, so this is some work that I did uh, with my co-authors, Owen Bennett Gibbs and uh, Neil Julian Ross. Um, and basically the, the problem that we were tackling in this work was this question of extracting circuits from representations of quantum computations that aren't necessarily quite circuit-like, right? And we already saw a talk about this earlier on the week. John gave a talk on this question of circuit extraction from ZX diagrams, right? And the reason we typically want to do this is because we might be able to optimize or simplify uh, some of these, some of these uh, descriptions of quantum computations in some other representation, uh, right? More than you could in a circuit representation. So, for example, these are some uh, images that I, I took from this uh, circuit optimization paper by John and uh, also Alex, right? And the thing is, uh, circuit extraction is hard, right? It's hard in multiple ways. Uh, as we already saw earlier on the week uh, in John's talk, it's hard in a complexity theoretic sense, uh, but it's also hard just to figure out how we can actually extract a circuit from a general ZX or maybe a ZH diagram, something like that, right? Uh, so we took the viewpoint, instead of trying to extract from ZX or ZH diagrams, we were looking at the problem of extracting from a different but somewhat related representation of quantum computations uh, called the sum over paths to see if that would uh, maybe lead to uh, some, some uh, easier methods of extracting circuits. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, unlike uh, the ZX calculus, I need to explain a little bit about the sum of paths representation uh, because many of you probably wouldn't have seen this before. Uh, so the sum of paths representation is a representation of linear operators over even power dimensional Hilbert spaces uh, as a sum indexed by binary variables. What I mean by that specifically is that we can represent a linear operator at uh, side here as a function from a uh, bit string x to a sum over paths indexed by a length k bit string y, where each path has a normalization factor uh, that's independent of the particular path taken, a phase, uh, which is e to the 2 pi i times some uh, real valued multilinear polynomial in x and y. Uh, and it also has uh, an output, a state a ket, right, uh, which is just a bit string, again, represented as a system of Boolean valued multilinear polynomials. And the easiest way to understand the sum of paths representation is just the examples, because it's what we've all seen before, uh, you know, in textbooks or what you've written down uh, when you've been working with quantum computations. I mean, maybe, maybe some of you write down that. Uh, diagrams when you work on quantum computations by hand. Uh, that's not how I think. Okay. Uh, so, for example, the, the S gate can be represented uh, as sum over paths, right, as a function that takes a uh, classical state X and maps it to classical state X with a phase of I dependent upon the value of X. And similar for the T gate, uh, with the phase replaced with an eighth root of unity. Right? Uh, the C naught gate uh, can also be thought of in this way, right? As a function that takes two classical bits, x and y, and just adds uh, the first bit to the second. And then the real fun starts coming when you start looking at branching gates, uh, like the Hadamard gate. So the Hadamard gate we can think of in this representation as sending a classical value x to the sum uh, over classical values y with a phase given by a negative one to the x, y. And uh, we can also represent uh, the cups and caps in FD Hilb uh, um, as some sober paths. Uh, I particularly like uh, this representation of uh, the co-unit here. Some other authors uh, choose to have uh, uh, symmetric 
uh, representation of cats and bras. Uh, I like this representation because then it makes composition of operators uh, very kind of clear. Uh, and what I mean by that is if we compose gates uh, in the sum of paths representation, we can kind of factor through uh, the composed gate by linearity, right? And then just use substitution to actually represent the composition uh, of two gates as sum of paths. So if we compose T after H, right, uh, we have the, the sum over paths for H here with T pushed in by linearity, right? And then we can just substitute X in the sum over paths description of T with this Y to get the final uh, uh, state for this composition. Okay, uh, so the sum over paths is not a new thing. It's been around for uh, for decades, uh, but classically it was used as kind of a tool uh, for some complexity theoretic proofs in quantum computation. But recently there's been this work on formalizing sum over paths so it can be used as a model or, or as a representation of quantum computations that we can manipulate, right? So in 2018, uh, I gave a rewriting system for some over paths, as well as a compositional model for circuits uh, as sums over paths. Uh, and then more recently, uh, a couple of groups, I think all of the authors of which are uh, at QPL physically right now, I don't know if you're in the room, but uh, yeah, uh, looked at connections between sum over paths and graphical calculi. So in particular, uh, they showed that, you know, for example, you can translate between uh, ZH and sum over paths. Right. Uh, Renault also uh, showed that you can have equipped the sum over paths with a dagger compact structure. So now it's universal uh, for quantum uh, mechanics. So that's great. Uh, and Renault also recently uh, posted uh, to the archive with a complete set of rewrite rules for a particular fragment of the sum of paths. Okay. And uh, the, the real kind of power or interesting thing about sum of paths, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, is equational reasoning. So uh, the sum of paths has a very nice form of equational reasoning where uh, it's very directed in the sense of you can try to reduce the number of variables that you're summing over uh, by applying these rewrite rules. Uh, so you can also think of these rewrite rules as identifying sets of interfering paths kind of physically, right? And then reducing according to the interfering sets of paths. It has a very kind of semantic computational interpretation of rewriting, which I like. Um, but I don't have time to go into uh, the particular details of these, these rewrite rules, and that's not what uh, this work is about anyway. Uh, but the main thing is I'm going to be using these three rewrite rules uh, throughout this presentation, E, I, and U, which are complete for stabilizer operations. Okay. Uh, so if you're familiar with uh, phase polynomial optimizations, the original phase polynomial optimization that we uh, published in this uh, 2014 paper, what it was actually doing was extracting a circuit from the simplified sum over paths form uh, of a quantum circuit. So it was computing sum over paths, uh, simplifying it uh, in a very kind of crude way, and then extracting a circuit back out again. Uh, and it was simplifying it in such a way so that you could extract the circuit back out. Uh, because it was maintaining enough of the original structure of the sum of paths, right? And this is this is uh, kind of like a, a very crude version of the same sorts of things that are done in ZX calculus with maintaining G flow, maintaining on uh, the circuit-like structure as you're rewriting and simplifying the sum of paths for the ZX calculus in, this, in that case. Okay. Uh, so like in ZX land, right, we have more sophisticated rewriting tools where we can go further into the simplification of, of our quantum computations, further into optimization, right? But the problem is when we apply these more sophisticated rewriting uh, techniques, circuit extraction gets significantly harder, 
Uh, and this is a question that we posed uh, specifically about the summer pads back in this 2014 paper. And I guess it's taken me almost 10 years uh, to kind of actually start looking at this. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the problem that we were mainly looking at in this work is the synthesis problem, uh, which is uh, analogous to the problem that John was describing in uh, one of his talks earlier this week. So the synthesis problem for the sum of the paths is given a promise that path sum uh, represents a unitary transformation, try to synthesize or extract a circuit implementing that particular linear operator over some particular gate set G. Right. And uh, we didn't just look at the synthesis problem. So we, we looked at the synthesis problem for Clifford path sums uh, and also general path sums. But we also looked at this problem of the hardness of checking uh, this, this promise, checking the unitarity condition. So before I wanna uh, get into the synthesis results, I wanna talk real quickly uh, about the unitary problem because this is a fun little result, I think. Okay, so the unitarity problem uh, is this problem of checking that, that uh, this promise holds, that uh, the path sum you're given represents a unitary transformation. So given a sum of paths, does it represent a unitary transformation? And what we show in the paper is that the unitary problem is actually Cohen P hard. And we do this by constructing a reduction from TOT, uh, which is the Cohen P complete problem of determining whether a propositional formula is tautology. So we reduce TOT to unitary uh, by constructing for a given proposition formula phi uh, a path sum that sends x to 5x x. So intuitively, right, if 5x or phi is a tautology, this will be the identity. And if phi is not tautology, there will be some x where five x evaluates to zero, uh, making this non-unitary. So we have uh, a proper many to one reduction. Okay. Now, uh, the interesting thing, right, in some of paths, we can actually directly encode a Boolean polynomial as a uh, sum, sum over paths, a dimensionless sum over paths. In particular, we have this equality where if we have a Boolean polynomial P, uh, P of X is equal to this particular sum here, right? But the problem is uh, if we want to write a propositional formula as a polynomial, uh, also known as an algebraic normal form, and we denote that uh, with this overline phi, it may take exponential overhead. And this is a problem that uh, arises in, in reductions involving SAT uh, and stuff. And the technique that they use in these reductions involving SAT is what's known as the Satan transformation. So you can use this Satan transformation to write a propositional formula phi as an equisatisfiable conjunction of constant size clauses. What I mean by that is that that Satan transformation adds new variables to your propositional formula, uh, but it, it maintains a one-to-one -one, uh, connection between the models of the original formula and the models of the transformed formula. So the Satan transformation of this particular formula, for example, would uh, add one new variable per subterm of the formula and assign it to the result of that subterm using propositional equality. And then return the conjunction of these clauses. So the way our encoding works, Satan transformation, uh, T of phi, we encode T of phi uh, as a path sum inductively by encoding each one of these, these uh, propositional equalities using this path sum. So it's very easy to encode propositional equality in path sums. Uh, and then what we do for the conjunction of clauses, we can just multiply 
these path sums because each one of these path sums uh, is zero or one valued, right? So we have this, this other image in a sense of Boolean algebra where we can just multiply uh, path sums together, right? Which corresponds if they're zero or one valued path sums to uh, uh, Boolean multiplication. Okay. And then the other neat thing, uh, we can then globally sum over all of these, all of these introduced variables, zi, to get a polynomial size encoding using only the free variables present in phi originally. And this is what the encoding looks like. So this is really neat because the Satan transformation, or at least I find it really neat, because the Satan transformation only produces an act with satisfiable uh, formula. But this is actually on um, a direct correspondence where we have the same three variables in our encoding uh, as we did in the original propositional formula. So that, uh, that completes our proof that the unitary problem is co p hard. Okay, but uh, moving right along, because I need to, uh, yeah, running low on time already, uh, synthesizing Clifford circuits. Okay, so that was uh, the first thing that we looked at for extracting circuits or synthesizing circuits from the sum of paths. In particular, uh, when we write the sum over paths form of a Clifford circuit, uh, for example, over H, S, and C, Z, uh, we get a path sum of this particular form, right? And this is a very well-known form, uh, sometimes called the quadratic form or the affine form, where basically we send uh, an input basis state X along some of the paths uh, to some state that's an affine function of the input and the path uh, with a phase that's Gaussian. Uh, and what we show in the paper is that we can write on, or we can rewrite a Clifford path sum in this particular uh, normal form we call the affine normal form, and which is again a, a well-known form, uh, using only the equations E, I, and U. Right. So in this particular form, what we now have is on. Um, K variables corresponding to a basis of the affine uh, space and the output, right? And the way this works is by eliminating variables from the sum until a minimal spanning set for the entire affine space is obtained. So this is, uh, you might know, very similar to the uh, normal form that uh, uh, I believe it was Tommy uh, uh, showed earlier on the week. Right. And uh, in the paper, we didn't have a unique normal form because that wasn't, uh, yeah. But I think uh, it can be made unique with the same, the same technique uh, from Tommy and Miriam's work. Uh, so that's, that's something uh, interesting that came out of QPL this week for me, at least. Okay. So, uh, the nice thing is once we have this affine normal form, now we can almost trivially uh, decompose this into a sequence of linear operators. Uh, in particular, if we decompose uh, L, Q, and F into functions either on the inputs X, the affine basis variables Y, or the X, Y cross terms, then the affine normal form just, just basically trivially factors into the following sequence of operators. Uh, this first one being over S and CZ, and then a C naught uh, computation followed by an H computation, then an affine computation, and S and CZ computation. And from this factorization into these linear operators, uh, we actually get a simple and constructive proof of this Bruja decomposition of the Clifford group uh, that Dmitry Maslov and Martin Rothler uh, gave in this 2018 paper. In their 2018 paper, they had a nine-stage circuit. They actually called it a seven-stage circuit, but uh, it turns out that they were uh, merging the X and C naught stages. 
So it was a nine stage circuit. And what we get uh, with, with our decomposition is an eight stage circuit of this form. And uh, you can read the circuit uh, directly off of the affine normal form, which is really neat. This is what the, the circuit structure looks like. And the other nice thing uh, from our proof, we also get uh, synthesis of circuits preparing stabilizer states or in general synthesis of circuits uh, with ancillas. In particular, we get this corollary right out of, uh, right out of our proof, which is that uh, if we have an affine normal form like this, it can be implemented with Clifford gates and ancillas initialized in the zero state if and only if this particular condition holds. And again, this is the, the kind of schematic structure of the circuit that we get uh, in this case. Okay. So now I promised that I was going to talk about synthesizing general circuits uh, because that that is really uh, kind of the main goal of this work. So I'm going to do a little bit about that now, uh, if I still have a couple of minutes. So uh, can we synthesize non-Clifford operators? That's, that's the big question here. Uh, so the, the approach that we took, at least initially, was uh, thinking about the sum of our paths uh, and inverting some of our paths to give us gates as reduction rules, right? So in particular, we can think of the Hadamard gate as sending uh, this, particular, this particular sum over paths to just the X state, right? So that gives us a way of kind of synthesizing by reducing to the identity using these reduction rules. And uh, then the first kind of example that we were looking at really was this uh, QFT derivation, right? And uh, it's actually really easy to uh, derive the standard QFT circuit from the sum of paths specification uh, listed here by just applying these rewrite rules. And I'm not going to go through the details uh, of this because uh, I don't have a whole lot of time. But uh, this is complete derivation of the, the standard textbook QFT circuit, uh, just using these, these reduction rules. Okay. And you might uh, fairly kind of say, like, well, yeah, that's just like one circuit, man, right? Can you do uh, anything more than just the QFT? Uh, so we start thinking a little bit more generally about um, this decomposition of unitaries into sequences of generalized permutations and Hadamard gates. Uh, in particular, generalized permutation is a permutation matrix times a unitary diagonal matrix. And we know that any unitary can be written as a sequence of alternating stages of H and generalized permutations. Uh, and if you're familiar with the number theoretic method of exact synthesis, this is exactly the kind of circuit that uh, the number theoretic method produces. In particular, uh, the number theoretic method synthesizes unitary matrices by applying some sort of generalized permutation so that you can get it in a state where applying a single Hadamard gate uh, or two level Hadamard gate will reduce some measure of complexity, some measure of distance from the identity. So the the nice thing is a very similar notion of distance from the identity in some of the paths world, uh, which is the number of variables that we're summing over. Right, so we have the same kind of structure as the number theoretic exact census, uh, where we can determine when a path sum will be reducible by the application of a Hadamard gate. So we say that a path sum is Hadamard reducible if we can apply uh, this particular rule to remove one of the variables. So uh, we came up with a general algorithm or more like a framework uh, for performing exact synthesis uh, over path sums, which is to uh, simplify using the standard uh, EIU rules, for example, uh, and then try repeatedly to find generalized permutations so that the result will be reducible. And then uh, as soon as we can't find a generalized permutation, 
uh, where the result is not reducible, either uh, report success if it's the identity or fail if it's not. And the big question here is how do we find this generalized permutation G? And does there always exist one? Uh, so in the paper, we developed a whole bunch of heuristics for finding this generalized permutation. Uh, and I don't have time to go into the details, uh, but there's a lot of fun stuff in there, uh, a lot of fun heuristics. But in the end, it is still a heuristic. Uh, we don't have a general method of finding, uh, always finding generalized permutation if it exists. But it works uh, decently well in practice, at least when uh, the density of gates in your original circuit um, is not that high. So we did experiments resynthesizing random Clifford and random Clifford plus T circuits uh, by first going to path sums and then simplifying and trying to extract a circuit back out. And it succeeds in most cases, uh, but as the density of gates increases, then we start having lower and lower success rates. So there's still work to be done. Uh, but one of the nice things that, that came out of this, uh, we found that we can actually decompile from low level gates, that's like Clifford plus T uh, to H plus generalized permutations. Uh, and this often reveals some of the nice high level structure that we have in circuits. Like for example, we can decompile this implementation of the Toffley gate uh, to actually get a Toffley gate or similar with the control desk implementation. And our implementation also manages to synthesize exactly the standard uh, QFT circuit, which is kind of cool. Okay, uh, so I, I'm out of time, but let me just conclude real quick. Uh, so, right, in this talk in this paper, it was kind of a grab bag of techniques uh, to a certain extent, uh, or a grab bag of problems. We looked at uh, the unitarity testing problem uh, and showed that's Cohen v. Hard. Uh, we came up with some normal forms and extraction of an eight-stage Clifford circuit uh, and a partial heuristic for general circuit extraction. Uh, but for the future work, right, uh, we really need to uh, prove completeness of our synthesis framework and also come up with a complete procedure for finding uh, these reducing generalized permutations. Okay, and I'll leave that then. Thanks. Yep, well, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I can see there's some questions. Uh, hi, Matt, Alex here. Nice talk. Um, when hey, you showed thanks. that data table, hey. <laughs> Um, I don't know why I'm waving. I don't think you can see me. Um, yeah, when you showed that data table, it, it, you had this average change column. Um, is, that, is that showing that you're actually increasing the size of the circuit when you're, when you're doing this in most of those cases? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so that is increasing the size of the circuit. And it's even worse than that, right? Uh, because uh, this is going from Clifford plus T originally to uh, something involving, say, multiply controlled Toffleys and multiply controlled uh, Z rotations. Uh, so, do you, do you think you might see better performance if you started with something like uh, Toffley Hadamard circuits and, and tried these kinds of tricks again? Or do you think it'll be pretty similar? That's a good question. Um, be better for Toffley Hadamard uh, because it, it's particularly effective uh, when kind of the, the high level structure is pretty simple. Like it's particularly effective on things where uh, it ends up being, you know, a, a, a reversible circuit, like a reversible transformation, but implemented over Clifford plus T, right? So that's why we get some of the, some of the nice decompilation results here where we can decompile uh, things like the Toffley circuit. Cool, thanks. Hi, Matt. Uh, thanks for the talk. This is John. 
Um, okay. So if you have a, uh, a like the type of SEDEX diagram you get before we do a sort of circuit extraction on it, like the type of simplified diagrams, uh, there's like a, an evident translation into a part sum, which I think you're you're aware of it. Like every spider becomes, sort of, like every internal spider becomes an, a path variable and the Hadamars and then the, the Hadamard edges become your like uh, faces as well. Um, okay. So I'm wondering, like, does this procedure, if you were to apply it to a part sum um, that you get in this way, would this give you sort of the same G flow extraction kind of thing? Um, do you, like, what's your intuition there? Have you looked at that? Um, so, it, in terms of the kind of G flow type extraction, no, I I don't think so, on um, because this is. This is doing something that's that's uh, I th I think uh, a fair ways off from uh, G flow kind of type extraction because uh, we we can do a similar G flow type extraction by applying certain uh, certain rewrite rules uh, that kind of stay within this this G flow type structure uh, specifically like. Um, the the I rule, uh, but with with uh, uh, a maximum degree for the the substitution, right? So that corresponds to rewriting really just the the Clifford parts of the path sum. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that that answers your question. Um, but basically, we haven't uh, thought too much about uh, the connections to uh, G flow type uh, extraction, just because we think that this is doing something uh, slightly different. All right, thanks. Okay, we've got one more question. Maybe while well, the next speaker can set up already. Um, how about measurements? Would you be able to um, understand, say, the 4T gate gadget for Toffoli within your framework, like Cody Jones' uh, thing that has a measurement and classical control? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, short answer, no, uh, because we were specifically looking at unitary extraction on the slightly longer answer, uh, I'm not sure in the sense that you can you can always push the measurements out in the Cody Jones on um, in the Cody Jones circuit, right? And then of course, if you were to implement that over Clifford plus T, all of a sudden now you have these extra T gates uh, that you thought you saved. Uh, but it might be possible to extract in that sense. But yeah, yeah, I, I would stick with the original short answer, uh, which is no, uh, because we're just looking at unitary uh, extraction. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, in that case, let's all thank Matt again. My name is Xiaoning Bian. Uh, I'm a PhD student from the Holiday. Uh, today I'll talk about uh, generators and relations for two qubit uh, Clifford plus T circuit. So it's a joint work with my supervisor, Peter Salinger. And uh, yeah, uh, here's the content here. So some definition, motivation, and one very crucial theorem uh, called the Red Mass Schreier theorem. And this is actually, uh, uh, in some sense, our theorem is just uh, uh, application of this theorem. I'll give some details about this theorem. And, uh, and of course, our main theorem and our proof for the main theorem, the proof fault line, and two key steps for the proof. And uh, so, first the definitions, Clifford operates, I, I think most of us know, but it's just quickly go through. So, the set of Clifford operators is just generated by the, the scalar, the, the H, the Hardman, the face, and the control Z. So, it's a closer and the tensor and the uh, multiplication. So. And we notice every such operator is of size 2 to the n by 2 to the n. So we see uh, uh, u is an operator on n qubits if the dimension is 2 to the n by 2 to the n. And we 
so Clifford is the Clifford operator finite, so it's not universal. So we add a T gate here. So we put omega here as h root of unity. Uh, uh, then the resulting operator is actually uh, universal. So we call the Clifford plus T operator. So you see, basically we only have, uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, generated for this uh, 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 Clifford plus T operators. And we've only focused on the case uh, when n equals 2. So so we uh, we view some new notation here. So T0 stands for T tensor I, and T1 stands for I tensor T, similar for other uh, H1 is 0. And we are also identify omega with the, uh, omega I, the 4 by 4 uh, scalar matrix. So, uh, so now, uh, and I will, I will also use the circuit notation. So, um, so the n equals two, the two qubits Clifford the plus t circuit actually form a group, and uh, uh, of course the group multiplication is the matrix multiplication, and identity is the uh, just the uh, matrix identity. Okay, sure. Sorry, <laughs> I just uh, a little bit nervous. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you don't need to be too close to the mic. Okay, sure, well. sure, sure. I can worry about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and this has the motivation. So, for the one qubit Clifford plus operators, we, we have very nice result. And basically, we want to extend the result to the n qubit, to the first step is two qubits, of course. So, we have such results to generate a relation for one qubit case. And we have very, ni very nice uh, normal form for one qubit case called Q, uh, called the mass manual or amino normal form. Actually, we even have the the it's a qubit case we have something similar uh, for the q treat case actually uh, it's uh, it's by julian and some julian ross and some other authors uh, in, in a few years ago not long ago and uh, and for the n qubit case we don't know there's no finite presentation so far and no normal forms and i should mention uh uh simon here and also, sorry, and and Bonova and Alexander they, they, and uh, Shane and uh, Nicola, I think they found a, fan, uh, a presentation for the n qubit uh, 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 quantum circuit. So not the Clifford party fraction, but for the all the possible circuit. And um, in their case, it, uh, also for the all n qubits. So in their case, they they use the parameters, a real parameter, real parameter. So they have infinite. If you expand the parameter. You cannot have infinite many generators and infinite many relations. And here in our case, only the two qubit case, only, only, sorry, yeah, only about eight eight generators after you expand everything, and uh, and this many relations, twenty relations. If you expand the indices, you only have thirty three relations. Anyway. Yeah, that's uh, some result new. It's actually quite new. Just a few days ago, they, they give a uh, presentation for the n qubit circuit, quantum circuit, and uh, and they also have normal form. Uh, and the, the other motivation is that this could potentially be used to uh, minimize t count. So, for example, I, I can just uh, uh, replace the two t by s, and we have some more complicated uh, things. Says okay, maybe. A number of five t gates can be reduced to a number of three t gates, something like that. And uh, so, next thing is the the Rad master Schrad theorem. So it's a theorem from the 1920s. Uh, it's a uh, result from group theory. It's actually used to find relations and generators for for a subgroup if the 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 relation and the generator for a supergroup is known. And uh, so, uh, because it's pretty. Uh, Essential for our proof, I'll give some details. So, some notation first. So, x star is a is, is a word over the alphabet x, and we 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 the the concatenation. Uh, if we regard the concatenation as a multiplication, it makes x star a monoid, and the empty word is the uh, identity, and we can we can also identify x with a set of one letter words. So, so let's make the x star a monoid. And we can define a relation on on, on this uh, on word actually. So normally we retain two words that relation uh, on two words. 
it's just an ordered pair uh, written as w equals v and uh, so uh, so a very special case of uh, this theorem so when the subgroup would actually equal the supergroup so in this case we can easily see why the theorem holds so uh, so let g be a group presented by x and gamma and let y be another generating set we want to find a relation for this generating set so uh, basically we define a back force translation from so uh, this x is the generating set for g so every element here is the group is the element of g and but uh, y also a generating set so x can be written as a product of y's so we just write down the word y one y two you just pick one such that uh, this product equals x y and etc and uh, similarly we can define the, the the back translation so any y is element of our group g and so can be written as a product of uh, x's so x1 maybe xm so and we can actually extend them to word so originally only the generating uh, element of generating set we can act actually extend to word just by so for example it's x1 x2 xn you just apply the f individually then do the concatenation so x1 fx1 concatenate with fx2 blah 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 fxn and similarly we can do the g star translation back translation uh, for so then then the Radmaster Schrad theorem says this y and delta is another presentation of g and the, the delta here is just some uh, only consider two cases so so basically for any generator in y you do a back translation to x then you do a forward translation in y this should be equal so just put this as a relation and another one is if we have relation in the gamma in the original gamma and do a forward translation after that then we got a, a word in y a word in y this should be equal so we just add them as a relation that this two is actually complete this 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 is uh, by the this theorem this very special case you, in some sense you can think of this as a, a basic change i i, I have a presentation in the generated x and applying this theorem i can find the generation generation uh, relation for the generated y yeah pretty easy uh a slightly hard case the forward version is actually uh work this actually works for any subgroup not the uh, not the uh, not just by uh basic changes actually you can find any proper presentation for any uh a proper subgroup and so the key idea is one one direction translation still works so any y still can because y in h in g still can be written as a product of y's just written down the 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 the, the word there but the other direction is uh, is no longer works because but you pick x is x it may not be in h may not be in our subgroup so uh, to deal with this case we 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 need to use a coset because we know uh uh, H is here, G is here. We know that all the codes that actually form a partition of the uh, the group G. So we, if we pick any, ignore this C first. Pick any X. This X is the group is the element of G. It must lie in some coset here. Maybe the C, C one H. Uh, here we use the right coset. H C one. H C two. H C three. Yeah, just map this to because it's a partition so this x must last in some code set write down the word here uh y1 and uh, and write down the the code set representative here maybe c1 uh yes and it's also we can also extend f to f f double star uh just uh, by here because we can apply this c oh another thing if we multiply it by c it still works because c a code set representative multiple times x still a group of elements still lie in some coset. So basically also we can extend the F to F double star. Basically we just apply this first we get something sorry. We get something uh word W1, W2, blah blah blah. And we get another coset of maybe C2 and we keep re uh, recursively uh apply this C2 then we apply F C2 and uh x2 and get something and we do the recursively we put all the uh, all the omega is we should get omega one here 
the omega 1 and we got the omega 2 here and C2 and we put the omega 1 here basically by concatenation can kill them and we put the, the last CN here and uh, after we define F double star then the red master stress theorem says F uh, Y delta is the presentation of H and uh, it's just similar to the previous special case you just do a back forward translation and Y translate uh, into a product of axis and then we put this identical set and apply to F triple star F triple star just the F double star we take the first component take the word here and back back to a word in Y this should be equal just make them equal put them in our relations and the other things for any relation then our gamma u equal t and gamma and we just apply triple star uh, many many times depending on how many codes that you have uh, to f uh, c u f triple star c t then because the because right originally they, they are equal so after translation it should be equal and just by adding them yeah just only two types of relations we got a presentation for the subgroup h and uh, so that four version uh, this is a monoid version so this not only works for groups also works for monoids and this is a new results uh, and we, we didn't see this results uh, uh, from uh, anywhere uh, so far and uh, and uh, the but the idea is similar it's basically the same idea and uh, yeah so in our case we use this monoid version to do the translation so here's our main theorem it says the two qubit clear for the plus t group is actually presented by x gamma. X is this this many eight generators, and uh, all four by four uh, matrices. And the set of relations actually here. Mm, so some are pretty trivial. So any scalar commutes with any uh, matrix. Uh, not any. So just omega. Omega. We only have. Uh, it's a specialized fraction, so we only have omega uh, to the power k uh, scalars, and some other also pretty well known s to the f s all of s all of h, and uh, here uh, s commute with control s because uh, our proof is actually in Agda the proof assistant, so we we actually need to specify very clearly s zero commute with control that s one also commute with uh, uh, control that to make the relation complete. Uh, so this is some obvious parts, and this is not obvious uh, uh, the Clifford parts. And also we have the t part t square equal to s, and t commute with uh, 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 control that. Of of course this implies s commute with uh, uh, control that something, and some other things. And uh, we got three non-trivial, non-obvious relations involving t. So it's uh, we, we we make it a symmetric. It's quite symmetric. It's very uh, it's symmetric, and uh, so we we also have the new notation the the the, the, the neg negative the control x and uh, we all know the t dagger, yeah. It's just some abbreviation for 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 the re for the for there. And also the control h control h we define control h to be this uh, circuit, and the the negative one is here. It's actually performing the control H operation, and uh, so the here the proof outline. So uh, we're working on this particular ring. So uh, it's the integers, and you put uh, one over root one over root in and i in. You got a bigger, slightly bigger ring, and uh, and uh, this uh, uh, yeah. So and we consider this group G U four R meaning. All the group of four by four unitaries with integers are not all the unitaries, but only the special kind. It, it can make make sense because uh, time. Sure, sure, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So, and uh, we, yes, let it be that group, and uh, so. And actually, our two qubit clear for the plus t operators. If you look at the entry here, it all lies in this entry, uh, lies in the ring. So it's a, actually a subgroup of the G, and actually actually a subgroup of index two, and uh, and uh, the consisting matrix who determine determines the powers of I because, for example, the T, 
zero is one one omega omega. Yeah, this is the the determinant is actually uh, i. Uh, anyway, and this Clifford uh, v the C T two group Clifford plus T group actually have index two in G. So we have only two cosets equal to two. And uh, and also another result is a presentation of G. This G by generation relation is known by by Seth Greeley. Uh, in, in, in his master thesis, uh, supervised by Peter, and we just okay. We know the presentation for this supergroup, and we want the presentation for this subgroup. Okay, we just apply right master Schreier, and uh, that should be done. But uh, it turns out if you apply this uh, uh, right master directly, okay. Sorry, mm. I, I, I generate this many relations, but I, I claim this one to twenty is complete. So I should prove. Uh, this one to twenty implies the two hundred and fifty four, and so that's the uh, ha, uh, the the main contribution of our paper. So we prove this in the in the proof of system agda. So the, the 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 final result can look like oh for some is any relation hold uh, if if uh, any relation hold here and also hold hold after the translation and conversely for the completeness any relation after the translation it holds then. Our curly for the plus t relation kind of implies uh, that relation. So another thing, not naively coding this proof is too much, and we we should use some automation. So the automation uses the poly operator root. Ah, uh, sorry. Okay. Very soon. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, and we kind of code this into uh, Agda. All of this right mesh Schreier and all the proof steps in Agda. So. Uh, yeah, just skip the, uh, the 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 automation part, and so here the f future. I want to try three qubits Califolopsis plus T, and also want to try two qubit Q treat two Q treat Califolopsis T, and also uh, some uh, some restricted some something as Califolopsis control S uh, group. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for the interesting talk. Um, I can see there's a question already. My question is regarding ancillas. So uh, for specifically, f oh, hello. Uh, yeah, we, we, we don't care about ancillas. Okay, so like okay. Toffley plus Hadamard is a subgroup of Clifford plus T, but to be universal, you need ancillas. Uh, and, okay, and. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so that wouldn't That's true, yeah. be but, covered here. Yeah, just, uh, but just ignore the ancillas, which is your formal group, so. Yeah. Mm. Oh. No, no. Because if you need ancillas, you need Toffley plus uh, something. But now we call purely control S. Yeah. Don't, we don't need ancillas. Sorry. Yeah. We don't. So think. Uh, so the control T qubit control T gate, which is a two qubit Clifford plus T, but you need three qubits to do it with clean ancillas if you're using Clifford plus T. That also would fall under the. If Three qubit. I think if you include ancillas, oh. you got the four group. I mean, the four group G. Now we only have index two subgroup. Yeah, that's why. Sorry, yeah, I missed. The okay, group. so that would be in the ring, but this it wouldn't be in this form. Sorry, what? Would that be in this? Uh, it would be in the ring. The unit you the you. Uh, yes. You have the ring. You include ancillas. Sorry. You go to the four group here, G. If no ancillas, you got a sub uh, index to sub subgroup. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Okay, sir. So we can do another quick question, and then we should move on. Thank you for the talk. Um, so from what I understand, the set of relations that you provide is complete. Yes. Um, is it also minimal? Uh, no, no, uh, no, not minimal. So for example, that's. Uh, the T commute of the control that actually implies S compute with the control that mm, definitely not minimal. Definitely not minimal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So let's thank the speaker again. Uh, yes. Yeah, so first of course, I have to thank the organizers to like make this amazing conference. You can hear from my voice that it's been great. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm Ariana Meyer, and uh, my work is together with Sarah, who's sitting in the front here. And uh, so, uh, yeah, basically, uh, this is a, a superconducting quantum computer. And uh, so you can see here, you have uh, these little squares. Those are qubits. 
And what you can see really clearly in this uh, quantum computer is that uh, not all qubits are connected together with these little squiggly lines. And the squiggly lines are the things you weigh, that, that you use to control your qubits. So we, from here, you can really clearly see that if you would like to do a, a two-qubit operation between qubit zero and qubit four, that's just not allowed immediately. So you need to like find a way to, around that to, um, to fix that. And uh, our way of actually doing that is uh, through circuit resynthesis. So the idea is that if you have a Clifford plus T uh, circuit, then you can cut up the circuit into sequences of CNOTs and single qubit skates in between. Um, and uh, then you can uh, resynthesize those CNOTs such that they are allowed because they're the only two qubit gate in this like specific gate set anyways. Um, so, uh, and then if those CNOTs are actually allowed on this architecture, then you are able to, uh, uh, then, then, you, then you fix the problem, right? Um, uh, oh, yeah, the last thing you need to do, do is like glue them back stuck together, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, the way we do this, we have this uh, parity matrix representation. So yeah, we have one of those sequences of CNOTs and this is actually a fully classical circuit. So what we can actually do is keep track of the, of the, the basically the action of the circuit on the qubits themselves. So you can, there, you can really see quite nicely um, like that, that what, what it's doing and actually what a CNOT does is it sorts these, these inputs together. So at the end we have these specific parities on all these qubits and then we, what we can say is like okay well let's write this down in a matrix and in the matrix we have this nice thing that if we have um, these output qubits here um, that we can write the, the parities like this so uh, for example if you have a uh, four yeah, so for example, for qubit four, and after computation, you have on qubit four a parity of one, two, and four. So there's the one, one, zero, one, because three isn't participating, right? So this is really straightforward. And now the nice thing about this specific representation is that if I have like an, an empty, empty circuit, then uh, the parity matrix that belongs to it is an identity matrix. And if I have the single C node, then the uh, the parity matrix that belongs to it looks like this. And what you can see if you squint a little bit is that this is equal to adding the target row to the control row from the uh, for the identity matrix. So now you can say, okay, you know what? A C not X corresponds to adding two rows together. And um, and that's really cool because that's an elementary row operation. So then if I have this matrix, this big parity matrix um, over here, then I can... Um, I can use these elementary row operations, keep track of them uh, to find identity. And we know all of this, we know this, this algorithm for that is called Gaussian elimination. And we know this so well that three years ago I already gave a talk about this. Um, so for people that were there, you might be able to recognize the slide. Um, so suppose we have this, this bigger example um, that I stole from there. Um, with Gaussian elimination, what you want to do, right? You want to have this this one here. You want to be that to be the only one in your in your column, and all the others needs to be zero. So usually, what you would do is you would add this one to all the other rows with the one. But now that's not allowed in the architecture, right? Because zero and two and seven are not conna connected to each other. So you need these little green notes in the middle to basically communicate the information from qubit two to qubit zero, or the other way around, depending a little bit of what your of what your interpretation is of what we're doing. But um, but yeah, so the way you do that is you, you add your your ones to the to the things that are zero, and then you add all the all the all the ones to each other, so that you then flush everything out from the bottom up, uh, so that you only have a zero again, and we call that reducing a column, right? And and all the details you can find in the talk from maybe like three years ago. Um, uh, but uh, the problem with Gaussian elimination is that you're basically uh, fixed to the order of w in which way you do your columns, right? So you have to go from left to right um, because of uh, the assumptions that you make about the structures of the columns that came before. Um, so you can't really... Uh, th yeah, so that's the annoying part about Gaussian elimination. But luckily, uh, there were some really smart guys before me that fixed this for me. And uh, they made this algorithm called Rocco, where they say, like, well, actually, we found a way to do this uh, in arbitrary order, um, as long as we just make sure that every time we choose a row and column to remove, then 
uh, we are not allowed to disconnect a graph, right? Because if we're disconnecting a graph, we have no way to like communicate our data from the one side to the other anymore. So as long as we remove non-cutting vertices, then that was fine. Um, so that's really cool. And then I'm like, okay, but why are we even going to identity matrix, right? So, uh, and this is actually the, the algorithm that I'm here to present in this like few minutes that I have. Um, is a perm row call, right? So suppose we have a, a swap gate, right? A swap is like three C-nodes. So then if you look at the parity matrix, right? It looks like this. And uh, so if I would go to and give this to my Steiner Gauss algorithm or whatever type of algorithm that we have up until now, um, what would happen is that it would say like, okay, cool. Then we have these three C-nodes and, uh, and we're done, we're cool. But I'm like, you know, but actually, we already had our qubit states, right? We already had one and two. All we're doing is moving them to different registers, but that's something we could technically do classically, right? You could just read them out from somewhere else and then fix it in post, right? So, uh, and, and, that, then, and then this, what happens is that the parity matrix is actually telling you where should I read my, where am I reading my, my qubits from, right? So you're saying, so okay, qubit two, right? Where we have here that I wanted to have in, in qubit, in, in register, oh, in register two, I have it currently in register one, and the, and the qubit that I had in, in register one, I currently have it in, in register two. So that's really cool, but now all I need to know is figure out this, this permutation matrix, uh, and then with, Gaussian, with the, the, the Steiner Gauss methods, you had to know that beforehand, but now we can find this dynamically on the fly. Yes, so let's do this. So we have this nice little uh, algorithm that reduces our, our problem until it becomes trivial, and the nice thing about trivial is that's like when we have one qubit, because then you don't have any connectivity constraints to care about. Care about. So until then, we, what we're going to do is we pick any row. As long as it's not connecting our, 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 um, our graph, then we can pick any row that we want. We can then pick any column that we want, who, uh, who cares? Um, and then what we do is we fix the entire column, as long as uh, make sure that there's only a one in the row. Then we reduce the row, uh, so there's only one in the column. And that's a little bit more difficult to figure out, like conceptually. But in principle, what you say is like, wait a minute, this is a system of linear equations of which rows I need to add together in order to get these, um, get my row to reduce when I just add them all together. That's really cool. Then we do the same trick that we did before with this like little graph and these green nodes uh, of adding stuff together. Except for now, what do we do with the green nodes? Well, very easily, we just add them twice because this is all Boolean. And everything is modular too. If we add it twice, you don't, we don't do anything. So that's how we're, how we're, how we're passing our information through. And, and then we're, we're done with that. So our column is our new allocation for the qubit on row. And then we can remove the row and column because it's done from the matrix. And then we can remove the vertices from the graph and we can start over again. And now the really cool thing about doing that is that now we have a, uh, uh, an algorithm that takes in, uh, uh, it starts with a specific mapping, so routes the entire circuit, and then now and ends up with a different mapping, all right? But quantum circuits are reversible. So now we can do this thing, it's called reverse traversal. It's a strategy that's used in Sabre um, that um, basically says like, okay, so if I have this method with this specific structure and my circuit is reversible, then I can just route the reverse circuit to find a new initial map, a qubit mapping. And then from the initial, new initial qubit mapping, I can find a new, new output mapping. And then from the new, new output mapping, I can find a new, 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 new input mapping. And then you just iterate over that until you're, uh, and until you have something that's smaller, because the idea is that you've tried to find something minimal. So like when you go back and forth, you, you scrape off some implicit swaps at the front and then some implicit swaps at the back. And you, you, you just, just get rid of most of the circuit altogether. Um, and, and the cool thing is that before, and this was not possible with these synthesized structures because they were not, they were, they were synthesizing exactly and not up to permutation. Um, so then, of course, we ran some some algorithms here, and it's a little bit probably a little bit difficult to see in the back. But uh, so you have this nice blue line that is x equals y. So everything that's above the line that means we have uh, c naught overhead. There's more c naught than when we started um, uh, mapping, right? So that's, you have to have that uh, maybe a little bit. And uh, and underneath is when we start saving things, uh, we actually end up with smaller circuits. And then what you can see is then if you go from Steiner goes to a, to Roco, okay, yeah, sure, it, it saves a little bit. Uh, then it's going to Perm Roco, 
It also saves a little bit, but then with this reverse traversal, we're removing a lot of implicit swaps in the system, which is really cool. Uh, so it works. Uh, if you want to know how this actually works, read the paper, uh, find the codes on GitHub, uh, figure out what good heuristics are, because uh, I, I just did something and it worked reasonably well. Then I tried with a star algorithm, which works really great, except for that it's so unfeasible to actually do anything with it. Uh, if you want to see how to like do some, yeah, how you, how you want to see it in action, there is an example. Uh, we have more connectivity graphs and the description of the benchmark circuits. So yeah, thank you very much and enjoy your lunch. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for this talk and for <laughs> finishing in good time. Uh, yeah, we're, so we have time for questions. <clears throat> um, so I, I remember with our original Steiner-Gauss algorithm, uh, if you looked at graphs which did not have a Hamiltonian cycle, they were a real pain and, and things sort of blew up. Uh, did you compare this technique on, on those kinds of connectivity graphs? Uh, no, actually, I didn't. But like um, for the for the perma call, it doesn't matter too much because if you look at there, so the, the um, this, we're, we're removing stuff that's just as long as we uh, from the edge of the graph, whatever an edge may be, right? Um, and in the sense that you just as long as it's not disconnecting, we can pick those. Um, so you don't have that problem with the Roco algorithm. So you don't have the problem with the Prim Roco algorithm. So it's really a thing for for Steiner Gauss. Um, so in in principle. Uh, it, it could save you because you don't have to like like go back and forth between this little one qubit because you have to go like, again it's, it's because you, the real pain becomes because you cannot get rid of that stupid qubit early yeah. right and then yeah you, you need to pass through it or whatever um, so yeah Uh, thanks, Ariana. This is a kind of a, a marginal concern, but uh, it just piqued my interest. Do you know, in general, how expensive is it to tell if an edge is cutting or not? Is an edge oh yeah, it's a uh, uh, it's not it's um uh, what's it called like a uh, breadth first search. So it's n log n, if I remember correctly, what breadth first search was. But yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so uh, the, the real the pain here is this thing that I didn't even talk about is the Steiner tree, which is an NP hard problem, but uh, uh, you, you have some proper uh, approximations you can do and like uh, enter the third. Um, but uh, yeah, time complexity also in the paper. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so maybe I've got another question. So you move pretty quickly through this process of kind of going back and forth between the uh, like synthesis and the reversal and I didn't quite catch exactly where the sort of advantage comes from in, in doing this back and forth process. Could you explain that again? Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, um, so basically um, what you do is so you, you, you start with a fixed location where your qubits are and then you, uh, you map your, your signals to something and in principle, usually what you do is you map it to exactly the same location, but um, it might be that there is a circuit that is shorter than that that uh, doesn't uh, that that makes the same qubit states, but in the wrong allocation, uh, like in the wrong qubit register. And then basically what you're doing is you're swapping from there. But the way that this is all done, that you don't literally see the swap. So it's actually really difficult to just like identify them. Like, oh, now here you're swapping them. Uh, so actually in, uh, in this example, you can see it quite nicely um, that like this two here, it ends up over there, right? So you might as well just leave it there. Why, why should we <laughs> move it there? Um, so that's the real, the, the, the one thing. Right. And then if you have this type of architecture, for example, uh, and if, yeah, so this is actually really nice to show it here. Uh, so, yeah, so you may, maybe you want to leave it here. But then if you have a line architecture, right, because two is only used there, it's actually not nice to leave it there. <laughs> because if this is a line like from one to two to three, then th this one you cannot remove because it will be non-cutting. So you, you have to like, like first move it there before you can leave it away. So then if you um, so it, from, if you go from one to the front, then you will realize that uh, uh, so th you have uh, basically you have an implicit swap here that says that you actually want to have this thing over there. But then when you go backwards, uh, if it's synthesizing the reverse stuff where you start with 
uh, with this 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 qubit here, then you might realize, hey, maybe I want to put my implicit swaps here, so I have my my this qubit become cuts here. And then if you do this iteratively back and forth, the um, the hope is, I mean, there's no no real hard guarantee that it that it really makes it shorter. But then the hope is that uh, because you try to minimize from the one problem to the next problem, if you find new mappings in between, that you will get then shorter circuits, essentially. <laughs> okay, thanks. Right, so um, yeah, maybe we can, if there's any other questions, we can leave those to the break and just, yeah, thank yes. the speaker again.